So let me begin then. Uh, I'm Lawrence Kermare. This are, these are the Thursday afternoon um, uh, speaker series of the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry here at McGill University in Montreal. We have several different series that run in this time slot. Um, global mental health, culture, mind and brain, culture and community mental health and culture and clinic. Um, and um, as I say, because of Zoom, uh, because of COVID, we have to go, we've had to go online. But the good thing about this is that we can connect to our friends and colleagues uh, around the world, many of whom have been here at some point or other as part of our summer school or other uh, ongoing collaborations. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're tempted to continue this even when we, when we can be back together in person, uh, just because it's so, um, so easy on the environment and so uh, positive in terms of these connections. So I'm very glad today to be able to welcome um, uh, Professor Anna Antic and uh, her research group, several of her postdoctoral fellows who are working together on a project of great interest to us. She's a social and cultural historian of psychiatry. She's written a number of extremely interesting books bringing forward both the sort of core history of cultural psychiatry and its relationship to global and international psychiatry, and also some, I would say, little known chapters in terms of things that have gone on in Central Europe and other places that are very important um, um, facets of this, uh, this larger history. Uh, we have some other historians actually online. I notice Alice Bullard and others. So there's lots of common interests and uh, lots of opportunity for exchange. Alice will be talking to us, I think, in a few weeks. So we'll also be able to continue some some of this aspect uh, of our uh, our shared interests um and uh, i'm not going to say more i'll let i'll let anna introduce the rest of her, uh, her team uh the overall theme uh you've gotten most of you've probably seen the poster it's decolonizing madness transcultural psychiatry international order and the emergence of the global psyche so i'm going to turn it over to you anna and uh, look forward to your presentation Thank you very much. And we're very excited to be here. And thank you for the invitation and for having us. Um, so I'm Anna, I'm heading this project of decolonizing madness uh, at the University of Copenhagen, um, where we are a group of historians and anthropologists, um, and also, as you'll see, clinical practitioners um, who are interested in uh, the sort of interdisciplinary explorations of transcultural psychiatry, its beginnings, its developments, and its also intellectual history. Right? Right. Um, so um, I will uh, take a, a few minutes to introduce the project and a little bit about my own research. Um, and then um, we will also hear from uh, the other uh, members who, who make up the decolonizing madness. Um, and I guess I should introduce them now or, um, so to make it easier to sort of not to go back and forth. So um, after me, we'll have Dr. Lamia Mognier, um, who is a, an anthropologist, um, a social worker and, and a therapist and uh, works on, on the anthropology and history of psychiatry in uh, Lebanon and the um, broader Middle East. Um, then we will hear from Dr. Dr. Gabriel Abarca Brown, uh, uh, an anthropologist and, and a therapist uh, from Chile, who works on the history and anthropology of um, psychiatry and side disciplines in Latin America. And we will end uh, with a Shilpi, Dr. Shilpi Rajpal, from, um, who is actually calling us from London today. And she is a historian of colonial and now post colonial India. Um, and will uh, also share um, her research with us today. So um, I will just um, go and try to share my own screen. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so um, the decolonizing madness, um, transcultural psychiatry, international order, and the birth of a global psyche in the aftermath of the Second World War. So this is the, the title of the project. And um, as I said, there was a group of historians and anthropologists um, and practitioners, and we're particularly interested in um, a historical perspective on transcultural psychiatry or cross-cultural psychiatry. Um, and so looking at this particular historical moment um, that we find um, extremely important, um, but is somewhat under-researched, a particular historical moment in the mid 20th century when uh, the discipline of transcultural psychiatry um, was arguably created, uh, born and institutionalized um, in, um, in, um, in its new guise. And um, uh, we, we are um, sort of interested in, in, in seeing how 
the discipline of transcultural psychiatry and the discipline of global psychiatry that emerges in this really important moment in the mid 20th century could serve as a window um, into um, sort of broader historical and political and social developments of the 20th century. So uh, a window into understanding, for instance, particularly the processes of decolonization, but also uh, because we're not all historians and we're not only about history, um, we also are interested in and in how this historical analysis and a historical approach to transcultural psychiatry can actually uh, be of use to um, the discipline now and to, the, to its practitioners right now. And so we're interested in seeing how um, understanding the roots and the origins of transcultural psychiatry, its developments, its experimentation, its, its various alternative episodes, its attempts to reform, right, and how its attempts to uh, deal with some of the similar problems that still plague the discipline, right? Or not plague, but still sort of uh, kind of uh, uh, um, uh, are uh, encountered by the discipline to see how the sort of historical analysis of all these issues can in fact inform uh, the discipline today and be of relevance to the to the to the practitioners of transcultural psychiatry um, today. So this is. Uh, particularly interesting moment because obviously of um, the, the processes of decolonization and the various conflicts that that decolonization uh, started um, in, um, in, in different parts of the world and, uh, and that it signified in different parts of the world. And uh, in many ways, um, many historians, including Alice Pollard, who is a uh, Tonight, but that sort of conceptualized transcultural psychiatry in the context of transitions and changes and sort of attempting to um, enforce discontinuities, right? And so there was an attempt by the discipline to remove itself from um, the uh, sort of problematic um, colonial frameworks and paradigms um, um, of the, um, say, of the, of the previous period of the first half of the 20th um, century and to establish, sort of to develop um, new forms of communication and sort of a, a new relationship between uh, Western and, for the lack of a better word, non-Western um, um, traditions or, or um, uh, systems of belief uh, when it comes to mental illness and healing. And so this is one important uh, moment in, in that regard. But of course, it wasn't only about decolonization. And, um, um, and this is something that we're really interested in, because this moment, the 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 sort of mid 20th century, is also a moment of, uh, of, of the the world recovering from a major catastrophe of the Second World War and the moment of post-war reconstruction um, and concerns about post-war reconstruction. I think this historical uh, conjuncture sort of decolonization and the sort of post-war uh, recovery and, and post-war concerns, this is very much what marks um, the marks the, the emergence and development the birth of transcultural psychiatry and, and very much fundamentally shapes um, its, its subsequent um, subsequent developments. Um, and so here I have a, a wonderful quote from Aubrey Lewis, who is one of the most important psychiatrists, British uh, psychiatrists, and it's a beautifully self-ironic and self-critical uh, quote when he says, many psychiatrists believe that they have a knowledge of the forces of human nature in individuals and in groups, which entitles them to take a large part in studying and helping people who are not suffering from any mental disease, as well as in advising on human relations between people and even between communities and nations. And here you can see how transcultural psychiatrists at this time, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, um, aimed to uh, join a broader political and social debate and also perceived itself as perceived themselves, right, as a particularly important um, um, activists or participants in, in these political debates as, as, as a discipline that sort of makes sense of cross-cultural conflicts and communications that facilitates such cross-cultural understandings. And this is, of course, particularly important for the, that post-war moment. So I, I really I like calling this period a utopian psychiatry and it's, sort of, it's interesting how um, that often gets forgotten in, in histories of transcultural psychiatry and post-colonial psychiatry, this moment of um, sort of moment in the his history of psychiatry when its core practitioners, its most important practitioners, believed in, in such an important political role for themselves and tried to carve out such an important political global role for themselves. And here you have some um, um, sort of utopian psychiatry, um, some uh, quotes that... Um, I find particularly useful um, in this regard. And this is a one time head of the um, American Psychiatric Association saying international tensions mounting, et cetera. Um, 
the psychiatrists have to uh, con sort of work on the concentration of wisdom of all towards the pr practical application of psychiatry to the problems of world citizenship, right? This is the search for this wasn't wasn't just about reforming the discipline or working out the differences, um, sort of uh, working out the continuities and co discontinuities with the colonial past, but it was about resolving the problems of world citizenship. Um, the uh, World Mental uh, World Federation for Mental Health says in 48 that the core aim should be the diminution of man's inhumanity to man and the promotion of an increased capacity of human beings to include other human beings within the category of the human. And finally, Brock Chisholm, um, the uh, psychiatrist and at one time head of the WHO, who says that psychiatry decides the immediate future of the human race, right? Not only a healer, but uh, it's a uh, psychiatrist is the one who seeks the causes of fear, anxiety, prejudice, and vicious passion. In fact, psych <clears throat> psychiatry is going to be the discipline, according to Chisholm, that um, eradicates war. And so this kind of utopian psychiatry, um, uh, this, this incredible ambition to intervene both in colonial conflict and post-colonial conflict, but also in the sort of general course, general issues and concerns of post-war reconstruction. And, um, and sort of assessing the causes of the of of the Second World War and genocide. This is what marks, to me, the birth of transcultural psychiatry, and very much marks its core discourses in the mid twentieth century and in a, over the coming decades. I would say, and one of the important so you you have this sort of uh, merger of decolonization concerns and concerns with the war and recovery from the war and preventing future wars. And something really important that comes out of it is this um, universalist framework. So the universalism, which um, um, historian Peter Mandler called ideological universalism, so that one that comes not necessarily only from medical uh, frameworks or medical biomedical paradigms, but universalism that comes out of political concerns and political aspirations, right? And so as a discipline that resolves um, sort of steps away from the hierarchies, hierarchical thinking of the colonial era, but it's also universalizing in the sense that it facilitates um, cross-cultural communication and, and prevents cross-cultural misunderstanding, which is looking for universals in different civilizations and culture. So this is really important. Um, and now um, what we're doing in, in the project is kind of looking at various uh, conventional and unconventional archives, psychiatric archives and archives of transcultural uh, psychiatry or in fact of colonial psychiatry, which immediately preceded it. Um, and I said, my question as a historian is always what can psychiatry and transcultural psychiatry tell us about processes of decolonization? But it we should really also flip the question and, and think about what can this history um, tell us uh, about uh, the concerns and dilemmas of transcult and challenges of transcultural psychiatry right now and what it can possibly, how can it is inspire us to see current debates in a different perspective, right? So a few um, concerns um, or uh, a few themes um, controversies that, that we're encountering in our different psychiatric archives. There is it, um, for instance, uh, there's something we can talk about and something um, that I find also very fascinating that, that the major contradiction that I keep encountering in my sources, which is lies at the heart of this psychiatric so-called ideological universalism in the, the early decades of transcultural psychiatry is that there is sort of a, um, um, a um, argument that cultural differences matter much less right than uh, than universal the universals shared among civilizations that cultures cultures cultural differences are only relevant as an outer layer and an expression of the universal core of the human mind or the, of, of mental illness right but within that um framework universalism there is um, a, a kind of strange preoccupation and obsession with culture, sometimes quite narrowly and reductively defined, a preoccupation with culture and difference, quite paradoxically, sort of a, a, an, um, an effort or an attempt to explain any kind of psychiatric discrepancies in psychiatric research, right, um, with references to culture quite narrowly uh, defined. Um, 
um, which leads to quite a lot of paradoxical um, uh, uh, results in in the uh, sort of the early decades of, of transcultural psychiatry. So this is one of the so these really interesting challenges and contradictions in their attempt to um, move away from hierarchical and sort of reifying thinking about culture from the colonial period or cultural difference. The, this 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 extreme universalism ends up being obsessed with culture in quite a different way. Um, of course. Transcultural psychiatry sort of promotes itself as a um, in these in the in the beginning, in particular, as a f facilitator of cross-cultural communication and exchange, as I said. But it quite often still continues to see cross-cultural contract contact, cultural change, sort of um, cross-cultural communication as a source of mental pathology and and, and a sort of uh, medicalizes and diag diagnoses that. So there is there is that particular contradiction, um, and of course. Um, within the framework of universalism and proclaimed equality of cultures and civilizations when it comes to psych psychological mechanisms or mental illness, um, we, we do see in psychiatric archives quite a uh, quite a striking persistence of various forms of colonial knowledge uh, frameworks and uh, evolutionary, as I said, hierarchical uh, thinking, essentializing thinking, etc. So I think it's it's the historical diving into these archives that actually brings about these really interesting uh, and important contradictions and, and challenges. And, and I would be interested in, in talking about how these contradictions and challenges have been resolved in, in the more recent times. And so the, the core research themes of the project speak to, to what I've just been um, sort of describing and, and, and we kind of organize ourselves around four major themes, one around psychiatric universalism and colonial legacy, sort of continuity. So it's like transcultural psychiatry is about transformations, transitions, discontinuities quite uh, quite um, kind of consciously and intentionally, but what we're um, actually seeing quite a lot is um, the uh, the importance of colonial legacies and, and colonial continuities very much across the post Second World War period. And this is something that really interests us. Um, and the, the search for universalism, how does it map on? How does this universalism map onto Eurocentrism or West centrism? Right? We're interested in um, international languages of psychiatry, different different research instruments, and their various uh, conceptualizations and adaptations and translations in the broader sense of the world. As you will hear from um, the rest of the team. Uh, we are really interested in sort of patient-centric uh, narratives and, and histories of transcultural psychiatry, looking at psychiatry as a window into everyday lives and practices of patients, but also looking at patients as knowledge makers of the of this um, discipline. Um, and finally, we're interested in migration and the sort of cross-cultural encounters as one of the core preoccupations of transcultural psychiatry, I think, throughout the period and up until now. Um, so now I have uh, probably very little time, uh, but I will give you just a very brief snippets about my own research um, that has to do um, with um, uh, that has to do with these broader themes that I outlined. Um, and my current project is a global history of schizophrenia in the in the second half of the uh, 20th century, um, and it's something that really interests and fascinates me about the, the relationships and um, links that are drawn in psychiatric discourses, um, but also in broader anthropological and humanities discourses at this time between schizophrenia, modernity and primitivism is the concept that's very important at this time. So I'm, I'm interested in the global history of schizophrenia in writing the history of this concept in the in the second half of the uh, 20th century, and I, I see this concept of schizophrenia as a as a site, so to speak, um, uh, for reimagining um, and reframing and reconfiguring uh, transcultural psychiatries or sort of psychiatries in general relationship to the so-called developing or decolonizing world. Uh, sort of, so sort of these discussions about schizophrenia and culture become uh, these debates about the relationship between culture and schizophrenia um, and schizophrenia around the world. Um, they they, uh, they become a sort of really important space for psychiatrists and uh, related professionals, related disciplines um, to um, kind of reimagine uh, global relations um, and um, 
uh, cross-cultural relations and relations between different societies and civilizations and to redraw these cross-cultural boundaries, right? And so within this discussion of schizophrenia and, uh, and culture, psychiatry, transcultural psychiatry, you can see them reworking their own relationship, their own um, understanding and uh, interpretation of the the non-Western world, their own their own understanding of this rapid uh, transformation of the uh, of the developing world, but also um, this becomes a debate about what to do with these evolutionary and hierarchical frameworks of thinking about cultural development and cultural difference it becomes a space for rethinking primitivism and what does that concept mean? How is it? to be translated in the post-colonial times, but it also becomes a space for um, uh, working and reworking these binaries, uh, modernity, backwardness, uh, com uh, psychological complexity, psychological simplicity, right? that, that play a very important role in colonial and post-colonial uh, psychiatry when it comes to thinking about schizophrenia. But also schizophrenia as a, as a way to kind of reimagine the world in this moment um, is also uh, used in the, in the Cold War, so not only in the relationship between, so to speak, um, North and South, but also the relationship between the West and East, right, as a, as a concept that reinforces universalism across cultural and uh, both both cultural and political divides, right, across political and ideological divides, um, and um, a, a space to, to delineate this new ideological universalist vision of um, psychiatry. And here, of course, we work with the IPSS, um, um, as a as a study that explores cross cultural nation nature or otherwise of, of schizophrenia, but includes not only the decolonizing world, but very importantly, East European countries, Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, at the very moment when uh, uh, the Soviet Union is being quite heavily rebuked for for uh, the politicization of political abuse of this very diagnosis of schizophrenia. So something really interesting is going on with schizophrenia and and global relations or international. Um, relations. Um, and as um, I think Lawrence mentioned at the beginning, um, my work um, also looks at um, this sort of alternative archives and as, as sort of um, the not so well researched um, stories of um, transcultural psychiatry. Um, and I, put, uh, I have particularly worked with East European and socialist and communist Marxist um, uh, psychiatrists in, in, in the Cold War. Um, um, and I'm particularly interested in, in how uh, we conceptualize communist psychiatry or Marxist psychiatry, especially in the context of transcultural psychiatry, because Marxist psychiatry tends to be dismissed as a failed project and tends to be often associated only with the Soviet Union, right? And it's uh, it's abused. But my research has looked at actually Yugoslav psychiatrists, because um, I'm not aware of any other East European psychiatrists going into the, the decolonizing world. And, and there, so Yugoslav psychiatrists going into the... Um, um, into the um, to the decolonizing world to share their know-how uh, and also to share the sort of the um, the core uh, techniques and technologies of socialist psychiatry, um, sort of revolutionary psychiatry. Um, and uh, what's really interesting, I, I think here uh, is, is sort of very important to, to me. This story is very important to sort of understand why history might matter uh, to contemporary debates in psychiatry. So not only something that happened in the past and stayed in the past, but history kind of is a, almost a well of inspiration and um, um, a sort of repository of alternative approaches, alternative solutions, alternative perspectives that might have been uh, forgotten, but might actually be useful for some of the uh, contemporary uh, problems. Um, and I think what I found in, in the sort of East European socialist psychiatric engagement with the decolonizing world is the, 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 the their civilizational liminality, right? The, their conditional whiteness, their conditional civilizational um, um, position geopolitically like in between Europe and non-Europe, right? It, in between us is really important for their vision, for their um, you know, radically different approach perhaps to, to the decolonizing world and transcultural psychiatry. And precisely because they see themselves as, um, um, as a Yugoslavia, as perhaps closer to Africa than to Western Europe, right, in the in the broader geopolitical uh, context, right, they're, they're able to develop the kind of global solidarity with, with, with their um, sort of colleagues and patients in, in the non-European world, so greater solidarity and a unique kind of solidarity um, when compared to their Western, West European or maybe North American colleagues. Um, and what's really important is also that they're thinking about rapid social change, about rapid, uh, about socialist 
social revolution and rapid social transformation. Um, and they're much more dynamic approach to this, this idea of change and, and, and transformation that um, they're, they're sort of um, a less um, hierarchical or static view of the of the developing world, uh, precisely because, of course, where they come from, uh, uh, the, con the country or the area where they come from, um, in their own mind, shares a lot of similarities with this decolonizing uh, world and sort of the concept of um, conflict, cultural conflict, but also conflict with the backward society and the concept of revolutionary personalities. Those are all really important innovations, I think, in transcultural psychiatry that come from the Marxist framework and they're quite often um, sort of forgotten and um, um, and marginalized. I think we could perhaps learn something from that um, new uh, uh, approach and, and this sort of alternative uh, perspective on on uh, sort of global connections and global solidarities. There are various problems with Marxist psychiatry and, um, um, and uh, one of them, of course, is that they, um, just like their Western colleagues, don't do away with uh, with some of the most important colonial concepts and colonial frameworks of thinking and still think in terms of civilization and, um, and primitivism. And this, just like any history of psychiatry, uh, tells us much more about broader society than just about psychiatry. It tells us much more about tensions, as I said, at the heart of socialist globalization, at the heart of Marxism, right? This tension between progressivism and emancipation, and on the other hand, quite a uh, quite a linear um, a civilizing mission and their own preoccupation with their with their own primitive uh, populations in Eastern Europe. So I'll stop here um, and stop sharing. Um, and I'll give it over to Lamia, uh, who will also talk about her uh, alternative networks and archives of psychiatry. Uh, hi, everyone. Can everyone see my slide? Wonderful. OK. Um, and I just want to say before I start that it's really exciting to speak to, to a, such a uh, wonderfully interdisciplinary group. And we, I look forward to many of uh, conversations and questions uh, about our projects. Um, so what I will be re presenting today is really a very new uh, research. And um, as you will see, the, the scale of uh, the scope of the research is quite uh, big. And I'm hoping to continue in the next few years in, in working on this research. Um, what I work on is um, really um, uh, tracing the different encounters, genealogies, and collaborations in the post-colonial Arab region. Um, uh, what I mean by psi encounters, so I focus mainly on psychiatry, but also psychoanalysis uh, and psychology as well. And as Anna said, one of the preoccupation of the Colonizing Madness Project is to think about um, how in different sites, in different places, um, uh, concepts like the psyche, like illness and like culture, were rethought, were reconceptualized, um, were um, reconfigured uh, in different places. And in, in my project, it would be in the post-colonial Arab nations, so from the 1950s to contemporary uh, times. And I'll talk about this idea of the contemporary times. So I work with different gene uh, generations um, um, of uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and um, in order to tease out the different debates, the different uh, tensions that came out of this work um, after colonial uh, colonialism. Uh, and the project starts with the so-called fathers of post-colonial psychiatry and tra or transcultural psychiatry in the Arab region. So in the upper left corner is Slayim Ammar from Tunisia. Uh, facing him is um, Salem Shadli, a sort of a hidden figure, a hidden historical figure that's just recently uh, re-emerged in 2015 because his daughter wrote an amazing autobiography about him. And now we have this rebel psychiatrist who fought French colonialism um, and try to sort of um, 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 uh, fight against racism within psychiatric uh, hospitals. Uh, so yet another father of post-colonial psychiatry. And then uh, Tijani Mahi from Sudan. And, um, and then in the lower right corner, Antanik Manoukian is his wife um, from the American University of Beirut uh, and from, from Lebanon. So the project is, it starts from, from these like main actors, uh, more or less known, at least where I come from, and tries to start um, mapping the different projects of psychiatry in the region and the different kinds of decolonization that happened in the region, whether they were by Marxists, um, such as anti-psychiatry projects, there were not so many, but mostly in North Africa, 
but also other forms of decolonization um, where psychiatry now moved, uh, the power of psychiatry moved from colonial sort of uh, place to, a, to the Arab nation state. So the politics of psychiatry also shifted within that. So the project of Arabization that I will talk about uh, some more, which happens in Lebanon, but in Tunisia much more uh, prominently. And of course, the project of modernization that the Arab um, nation state was preoccupied with and the making of the Arab man and the Arab woman and you know, therapeutic citizenship. And other projects more important in Lebanon, for example, like humanitarian psychiatry and the ways in which these actors and experts thought about political violence, about war, and about uh, conflict in terms of it, their injury to the psyche um, and of uh, them making, uh, uh, producing illness. And of course, more classic projects like institutional psychiatry. So my research is also interested in the role of these side disciplines and very changing roles depending on the time period that we're talking about. And I will give a very quick examples in 15 minutes about that role. And uh, so the role of the side disciplines uh, in society, but in politics and in this process of subject making. And of course, many of these um, um, roles shifted in time, but also you, you had different projects at the same time that were in conflict with one another. And I'll talk about that as well. Uh, uh, currently, I've only done research in Lebanon and Tunisia and hopefully in Sudan soon. And I cannot, and for the future, for the future of this project, I, uh, this cannot be done without looking at Egypt, of course, and Iraq and Syria and other places as well. Um, so just to talk very, very quickly, since we are all, at, um, I'm an anthropologist interested in history. So I work with archives, but I'm, I'm mostly an anthropologist and I think a lot about ethnography and my methodology is very much uh, archival and ethnographic. And I'm very, um, um, uh, interested in the ways in which I think that's what Anna also said in her presentation, these narrative, these very past narrative or these very um, different projects echo and reverberate in today's discourses and in today's debates um, on what it means to be ill, on what is culture um, and what do we do with culture and therapy. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm, I have this very broad scope because I'm interested in these echoes and in these reverberations um, um, and in the relationship between these past narratives and current ways in which we think about uh, illness and, uh, and suffering. Um, another uh, a site, um, a very important um, site for analysis for these projects are, the, of course, the psychiatric institutions and the mental the different psych institutions. Uh, they were places where many new therapeutics were experimented with, new drugs were given, new patients were encountered after colonialism. There was a, a new kind of reorganizations of these um, hospitals that I'm very much interested in. Um, so uh, in the upper uh, picture is the picture of the Lebanon Hospital for Mental and Nervous Disorder, which I'm looking at its archive. And also uh, the second picture is Mustashfa Razi, a Razi mental hospital in Tunisia. I'm also looking at the archives of this hospital as well. A Razi hospital is still uh, um, functioning until today. And the Lebanon Hospital for Mental and Nervous Disorder closed its doors during the Lebanese Civil War in 1982. So these... Uh, Thai institutions were places where Thai knowledge or psychological and psychiatric knowledge were being made, made and they were being uh, negotiated, produced, and, and thought of. Uh, Salim Ammar, for example, the uh, Tunisian psychiatrist, experimented with indigenous and was interested in indigenous um, uh, practices uh, of healing, with, uh, which fit with his generation, but then later on, other a Tunisian psychiatrist quite dismissed these experimentations, but um, he was also the son of a Sufi healer, which I think is very interesting uh, that he chose um, in his generation to, uh, for him to choose psychiatry, but also to incorporate uh, what he knew from his father into especially the, uh, the uh, uh, illnesses like schizophrenia and psychosis as well. So all of these are happening within these psychiatric institutions, but also I'm very much attuned, and this research is very much interested in patients as equal knowledge, uh, equal makers of psych knowledge. And um, so the projects bring on uh, uh, multiple uh, patient voices and patient narratives, 
mostly through archives, but also through this contemporary present moment, where many of these um, uh, narratives actually echo very vividly in Arab popular culture, especially the women that um, you, you see here, who's uh, Maiziedi, who's a very uh, famous uh, feminist intellectual of the 1930s. Um, she was Egyptian, Palestinian, and Lebanese, so she's very much an Arab woman, um, and she traveled a lot in the in the Arab world, and then it was institutionalized in the late 1930s. But then her um, uh, story still echo today in many of these literature that you see here. But even in even today in Egypt, uh, because of the famous singer Shirin, was very um, uh, currently placed in a mental hospital because. Uh, because of her family members, she was acting erratically, and then the story of Maizidi reappears again and is uh, um, to echo social injustice, to, uh, to echo a problematic relationship between women and psychiatry. So my project is interested in taking patient voices seriously um, uh, and their narrative seriously as makers of um, illness as make it, makers of, of also people who experiment and try on these new therapeutics and these uh, new kinds of treatment. Um, and this is at the core of my book manuscript, um, Psychiatric Afterlives, Narrating Illness, Gender and Violence in Lebanon, is mainly focused on, on Lebanon. And uh, it, it presents a new history of psychiatry and public life in Lebanon. So it works on this tension um, by engaging the voices of patients and therapeutic communities into the story, into the history of psychiatry itself. Um, so we talked about uh, hospitals and institutions as makers of knowledge, but also uh, um, of patients and their family members as equal diagnosers and equal sort of governors um, of what is illness, what, what is abnormality. And another uh, locus, like locus of analysis, nexus of analysis uh, for this project are of course these um, transregional collaborations and global collaborations that happened. And of course the East Mediterranean Regional Office of the WHO that sought to bring uh, people like Slaim Ammar and um, Shanin Mahi and uh, uh, Atralik Manoubian together to think and come up with a mental health um, group meeting. I don't know if you can see the pictures. So these are their, the papers that they shared in the 1960s, 60s in Alexandria. So the, the research also uh, maps these uh, centers of collaborations. Um, including the one on the global level, but also on the regional level and on the national, the making of the national societies and organizations. So here we see in the 1960s, Sayyid Muhammad was interested in addiction in Tunisia and was mapping the, uh, the evo evolutive aspects of addictions in Tunisia. The Janil Mahi was interested in religion and social conformity and its re uh, relation to illness. And Antoinette Manoubian was interested more in training, the training of nurses and psychiatrists in uh, Arab uh, countries and the way, and actually he would go back, he would go and uh, establish a very important uh, training center within the Lebanon Hospital for Mental and Nervous Disorders. Um, but beyond uh, these institutions and beyond the central actors, so-called fathers, there's so many fathers of, uh, uh, of things, uh, so beyond these central actors and institutions, the project is really interested in mapping the multiplicities of actors and multiplicities of debates. And I don't know if you can see my arrow and, uh, and definitely uh, uh, map the marginal uh, actors in them. So this, for example, uh, 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 psychiatrist is Ahmed Mohamed Nabulsi, who I found out about him as an expert of Lebanon. I was shocked that I found out about him very, very late because he used to work um, and practice in Tripoli at the margin, you know, at the, at the borders with Syria. And I found out about him and his amazing work because of uh, Anwar Jaraya, who, who is a Tunisian uh, psychiatrist who collaborates with him. And he also, uh, Anwar Jaraya takes part in the Arabization project uh, in Tunisia. And, and they all uh, collaborated with this person who also was very much interested in Arabizing, making psychiatry, psychiatric knowledge um, in uh, uh, Arabized. Uh, when I ask other, other actors that are very much central and important, like Brigitte Khoury and Shaika Zayan, about this person, either they didn't know who he was, or they dismissed the Arabization project as being an Islamic, Islamic kind of therapy. And this very quickly shows the different sort of clashes between these projects and the different politics that these projects have in, in, within one side. 
And my, my interest is to map also the, the tensions between Monir Shamaoun, who's um, a very famous psychoanalyst uh, French, uh, with the French tradition in Lebanon, and not so famous Ali Zayaour because he uh, worked uh, in the Lebanese Public University and also uh, wrote in Arabic um, on uh, philosophy and psychoanalysis. These are kind of the, I'm in the process of collecting the publications of all these uh, people. And uh, for, for example, these are the books of Dr. Ali Zayaour, um, a philosopher and psychoanalyst. To, to compare them very quickly to the periodicals of Munir Shamon, for example, Dr. Ali Zayaouri is interested in um, dream explanations and the philosophies of prophecies, and also interested in the Arab self and uh, the, the cultural unconscious. So for him also, Islam and the Arab culture are very much within psychoanalysis. Whereas for Munir Shamon, and this is a very, very early sort of analysis, Islam is something out, outside of psychoanalysis. It's an obstacle. It's something to overcome or something to, to sort of, uh, um, that it doesn't, it doesn't go within uh, explaining what psychoanalysis is. And I'm interested in these kinds of tensions, debates, and political engagements that many, that many of these actors had with, with the side disciplines themselves. To say, I have three more, more slides, and to say uh, very quickly something about the Arabization project, and here to, uh, focusing um, particularly on Tunisia. Um, so what kind of project was it? It was definitely a decolonial project because it sought to sort of um, um, take this side knowledge and make it more Arabic. Um, and this was the, the project of Slaim Ammar, who, as you can see, wrote uh, extensively, not just on psychiatry, but on Arab, um, um, Arab doctors. So uh, Razi, Razaz, uh, Abisan ibn Sina. I mean, they claim these also figures as Arab. I mean, you can claim them as Persian. We can claim them as uh, many different kinds of figures. Uh, but the but the idea was it was to to bring together a knowledge that uh, was interrupted and uh, sort of injured by French colonialism uh, and European modernity that sought to place itself as the um, uh, the maker of psych psychiatric knowledge and it was very important for Slaim Ammar and his other friends like Ahmed Diab and Anwar Jaraya. To, uh, to translate, of course, to create these dic dictionaries, but also to um, bring to, to back to history, the history of Arab psychiatry. When I interviewed Dr. Ahmad Diab, for example, who established an entire museum of Arab medicine by sculpting himself, like uh, surgery tools, surgical tools, painting himself older paintings. So it was very much a, a big, uh, an act of love, I would say. When I asked why would a doctor and a surgeon do this kind of work, he said in classical, Fusha, in classical Arabic, because I'm piecing to the Ajma Shatata Nafsi, because I wanted to piece together the fragment, the fragments of my soul. And I think this is the fragment of my soul, of course, that was fragmented by colonialism. And I think this is at the core of the Arabization pro project, is to relink. Um, um, and relink an entire culture, entire history, and also for the Tunisian, also Phoenician culture, not just uh, Arabic culture, back into history. So what kind of project Arabization uh, project was? These are paintings outside the Arrazi Mental Hospital, um, uh, painting Pinan, Freud, Al-Kundi, and Ibn Rushd together. And I find it very, just an anecdote, amusing that Freud looks like a Tunisian, like a little bit Arabic, a little bit Tunisian. Uh, but it's it's about claiming a place for Arab psychiatry in the history of, of psychiatry itself. It's a, a claiming of a place, and it's not just about um, claiming yourself and implementing uh, a knowledge or uh, a cultural manifestation of psychiatry. It's claiming yourself as makers of this knowledge. But of course, something uh, that I don't have so much time to talk about, but Arabization was also about popularizing psychiatry for all classes, not just for the French speaking Tunisian as well. That was also very much part of this, uh, of this project. Um, the, my last slide, uh, is about these the clashes that have happened between the project of Arabization and the project brought forth by Fanon, but also the project of um, uh, Siddiq Jeddi uh, and the anti-psychiatry movement in North Africa. 
So Fanon um, uh, arrived to uh, the Al Ghazi Mental Hospital when uh, Sayyid Ammar was there, and famously they got uh, into many fights. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, when I interviewed the disciple of Sayyid Ammar, uh, the, uh, uh, so the, the person who was supposed to take to take on this Arabization project, he said that the reason that there were the, all these fights was because Fanon was very much a colonial French uh, person. And I, uh, and I was very shocked by this and I, and I told him, but no, he's not. And we had this interesting conversation, but thinking back on it, I think the, the whatever Fanon was uh, uh, proposing was very much French for Slaim Ammar and for uh, even the anti-psychiatry, what anti-psychiatry uh, represented for Sadiq Jaddi, who's a, who's a much younger generation from both of uh, these two, also clashed with Sayyid Ammar, was very much, had a very different political epistem and political signifiers than what Arabization um, meant for Sayyid Ammar. And this is at the core of what this project is trying to do, is trying to look at these kinds of tensions and, and debates and, um, and uh, within the remaking uh, of psychiatry. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it's my turn now. Let me show. So uh, my name is Gabriela Barca, and thank you for having us in this exciting uh, space. My presentation today is entitled The Birth of Transcultural Psychiatry in Chile. It's a work in progress. So oh, I cannot. Okay, so my aim today is to describe the transition from a project on migration, multiculturalism, and mental health to a project on the birth of transcultural psychiatry in Chile. The first one is my book that is based on my PhD thesis, and the second one, the second one is the research that I'm starting now in the postdoc. By doing this, I would like to highlight how a historical perspective can interrogate current debates about cultural and structural competencies, and at the same time, explore some distinctions between transcultural psychiatry in Europe and Latin America. Uh, in my previous research, I sought to interrogate how new discourses relating to migration, multiculturalism, and mental health have taken shape in a post-dictatorship neoliberal Chile from the 1990s to the present. I explore how, through the introduction of health reforms and the global mental health agenda, side technologies have impact and shape Asians and Dominican subjectivities and everyday lives. I would like to explain briefly why the focus on mental health reforms in Chile. The Chilean case is highly relevant for current debates on global mental health and the so-called global psych. Some research have argued that Chile has developed a silent revolution in mental health since the end of the civic military dictatorship specific military dictatorship you know, commanded by Augusto Pinochet between 1973 and 1990s. That is the introduction of policies, strategies, and technologies designed to improve mental health indicators even before the call to scale up mental health programs in low middle income countries in 2007. Some clear examples of this revolution have been the psychiatric disinstitutionalization process from the 90s, the inclusion of clinical psychologists in primary health centers from the 90s as well, and the implementation of the National Depression Treatment Program in primary healthcare centers in 2001 the first of its kind in a low middle income country. You can, maybe you know the book of Clara Hahn, Life in Death, that she showed in, in a very good analysis, the different relations between women, communities, and this program. In this research, I focus on the interactions between side technologies, Haitian Creole medicine, and voodoo. 
Haitian Creole medicine is a set of knowledge, practice, and values related to health and disease in which practices from biomedicine, herbal medicine, and voodoo converge. For its part, rather than a religion, voodoo is a worldview that plays the subject within a universe composed of ancestors, spirits, and the natural world. For these reasons, personhood, health, and disease, as well their classifications, are made up of natural and supernatural categories. I conduct a multi-site ethnography over 14 months in 2018 and 19 in a low middle income neighborhood of North Santiago. I carry out observation at the family health center, social organization, churches, and migrants everyday life spaces such as their houses, neighborhood, and sport clubs. I also interview practitioners, migrant family members, evangelical pastors and voodoo healers. In this work, I argue that there are multiple forms of becoming a narrow migrant in a post-dictatorship neoliberal Chile. Through the negotiation, assimilation, resistance, and refusal of biomedical and psychiatric interventions, migrants engage in heterogeneous subjectivation processes that both affirm and challenge normative values of integration into Chilean society. This subjectivation process revealed that site technologies challenge migrants' representation of themselves, their malice and suffering, and their mental health. These processes also reveal how Haitians and Dominican develop individual, family, and community coping strategies to mainly address the afflictions in spaces such as neighborhoods and churches. Um, different uh, practitioner reaction to the new multicultural context caught my attention in this project. The Municipality Health Department has promoted several training models on migration, Haitian culture, and cultural competencies since 2017. At that moment, practitioners value this initiative. They found in these spaces some tools to understand Asian health trajectories and specific issues related to mental health and sexual and reproductive health. However, a significant group of practitioners criticized the cultural competencies approach by saying that it was too narrow and simplistic model. They request new training models with a more complex approach to cultural competencies. I call this the structurization of culture. That is the process through which practitioners may de-essentialize the category of culture and advocate for the intersections between culture and other categories such class and gender. But who were these practitioners? Were they aware of debate on cultural and structural competencies? What did they mean by a more complex approach to cultural competencies? At that moment, I realized that those practitioners were mainly practitioners with experience working in the public health system more than 10 years, like even 15 or 20, and practitioners who identified themselves as closer to Marxist social science and humanities. This is the starting point of my current project. My hypothesis is that, is that the way of making mental health, hacer salud mental, as practitioners say, is rooted in a long tradition of community work framed within Latin America social medicine and community psychiatry of the 60s and 70s influenced by the reformist movement of the time, as well as the incorporation of a gender agenda since the 90s. This context led the various health actors to understand the wilderness in terms of class, like poverty, inequality, and gender, rather than ethnic and cultural terms. This year, I have collected archives and conduct interviews in Chile, 
Although I have found archives in public institutions such as universities and hospitals, for example, mainly in journals of psychiatry like Latin American and Chilean journals, I have found the most relevant archives in private collections. This is because many archives were destroyed during 1973 and 74, the first two years of the civic military dictatorship. I would like to explain a little bit the context, this historical context of the called the Chilean way of socialism in the 60s and 70s. An effervescent political and social context led to this way of making mental health. Different reformist movement and land reforms took part in Latin America between the 50s and 70s. In Chile, specifically, the election of Salvador Allende as president, the first Marxist president elected democratically in 1970, put the eye of the world in the country in a contest marked by the Cold War. Different personalities traveled to Chile to get closer to the Chilean wave of socialism. In 1971, Fidel Castro visited the country and stayed a month, something that was very problematic at the time for Salvador Allende as well. And many European intellectuals settled in Chile looking for a new opportunity for socialism. University here play a crucial role in the project of social transformation. Scholars and students advocate for equal access to university. Students also engage with the moral duty of participate in voluntary work in different regions of the country. In this context, medicine students and psychiatric residents work in remote place in the north and south of Chile. They familiarize themselves with the new realities and groups such as Mapuche and Aymara and people from Chiloé. Chiloé is an island in the south of Chile. This context, this context was a niche for the emergence of community psychiatry experience. Today, I would like to mention three and describe one of them. Although each of these experiences had different intellectual traditions, for example, psychoanalysis, phenomenology, and so on and so on, all of them had something in common, the centrality of class a category to understand mental health issues. For example, here we can see the first on Marconi, who was a psychiatrist with training in psychoanalysis and epidemiology, and he conducted studies on the prevalence of alcoholism and neurosis. He created a program that is called the Intra-Community Program in the South of Santiago. And we have right now like documents that support our research in a very easy way. But the other two experiences, Martin Cordero and Luis Weinstein, uh, we have just a few archives of their experience. Martin Cordero was a psychiatric influence by this rehabilitation approach of Douglas Bennett. And he worked in a community psychiatric experience in Temuco in the south of Chile, the place where Mapuche people mainly live. He had relationship with European intellectuals living in the country like Milan and Jarka Stukli and others. But in the 1973, uh, he lived in the exile in the UK and he became a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Louis Weinstein instead was a psychiatric specialist in public health and his approach is entitled Salud Mental Poblacional. This is very, uh, a little bit hard to translate because the literal translation is like population mental health. But when in Spanish from South America, this is a little different from Spain, when we say poblacional, we try to emphasize the exclusion or segregation of low income communities. You know? So uh, he was founder of the Center of the Social and Medical Anthropology at the University of Chile and the Minister of Health of the state. But in the 1973 was destroyed all the document. It was destroyed the center. Um, 
I would like to briefly describe Juan Marconi's work called the Intra-Community Program. Marconi, as an epidemiologist, conduct study with direct methods on the prevalence of alcoholism, the first of its kind in Latin America. He designed three mental health programs based on those studies, programs for alcoholism, neurosis, and cultural deprivations for parents and children. He promotes community interventions in which psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and students work with social organizations, for example, a school and churches, community leaders, and the community itself. One, is, one of the most relevant interventions was the mental health workshop, like Las Jornadas de Salud Mental. They were spaces where practitioners and several social actors, for example, policy officers, teacher, priest, pastor, et cetera, et cetera, share knowledge about how to deal with alcoholism within the community and improve family quality of life. As far as we know, Marconi and his group organized three workshops in which at least 100 or 200 people of the community participate. Juan Marconi was a prolific researcher and writer. His work was mainly published in Spanish in Acta Psiquiatrica y Psicológica de America Latina, the most influential journal of the field in the region. One of his most relevant articles is entitled The Chilean Revolution in Mental Health Program. Again, the idea of revolution in psychiatry in Chile. Like in other contributions, he used terms such as social class, capitalist society, social structure, working class, class struggle, and social change to understand mental illness. Moreover, he made a strong argument, for example, that any honest and scientifically found mental health program must seek the abolition of class society. Right? Very, very, very strong. Although he recognized the role of popular and native medicine, he usually did it to explain that doctors who belong to the high class did not understand the dynamic of segregation and exclusion. exclusion sorry. For Marconi, health is mainly an economic and social structure matter. He tended to use the culture categories as a mark, especially for this epidemiological study as he believed that community psychiatry did not have a tradition of systematizing experience, he designed some models in mental health to organize community intervention. The Pan American Health Organization used some of these models in the 70s and 80s. So what we can say so far in this stage of this research the Chilean case interrogates the idea of transcultural psychiatry as a branch of social psychiatry. In Chile, the roots of transcultural psychiatry are embed embedded in community psychiatry experience. Thus, rather than a redefinition of culture and race categories in a decolonial world or in a decolonial context, this experience showed the centrality of the class category to understanding mental health issues in individuals and communities. Besides this, besides, this case showed how in the 60s and 70s, practitioners engaged with the community from the first years of training, something very similar to what we hear nowadays on the training of structural competency models. Likewise, these experiences promote an approach of psychiatry beyond psychiatry, in the sense that psychiatry must disappear within the community, within the community. So I will stop here and give the platform to Chilpi. Hi. Uh, I'm going to discuss my work here on decolonizing the mind and the birth of global mental health in India. My work basically, um, to the first, so the first slide, my work focuses on the local, national, and global histories of psychiatry in colonial and post-colonial India. 
It focuses on individual psychiatrists, the role of state, and it just opposes it with the role of state. Um, it looks at and situates psychiatrists as historical actors and the emergence of psychiatry and looks at psychiatry enmeshed within the political histories of the period. Uh, and particularly my work, uh, my book has, my book which is published, which was published in 2020 is on colonial India. Um, and right now I'm talking about psychiatrist identity within a colonial India was a result of multiple processes, which included administrative reforms, legislative changes, epistemological shifts and political alteration that both happened at national and international level. But by the 1930s and 40s, psychiatrists were a reified category, especially by the 30s, and they acted as a social group um, in order to you know, define their interest, define the interest of psychiatry in, in order to put their interest in front of the state. State at this point of the time, and here I quote, uh, regarded psychiatry as white man's burden. Uh, but by the 30s and 40s, psychiatry emerged as a professional discipline within colonial India. Next slide. So my research here focuses on several questions. My question here, especially at the, at the eve of the independence, and, and I, I try to map the period from 19, uh, 1930s to 1980s. And I my question here is how and when did psychiatry crawl, crawl out of the colonial clutches? And what were the constraints of this transition? How did the hegemonic discourses of colonialism, nationalism, and later globalization continue to control the professional growth of the mind sciences in, the, in India? How and when did the language and landscape of conceptualizing madness found on the basis of universal experience were formulated? And what were the experiences of patients in the everyday life, especially inside and outside the walls? How did they live with this universal experience, especially uh, in the context of India, which was coming out of being one of the major British colonies, how these their experiences changed. Um, how far then does the psychiatric literature reflect perceptions of both psychiatrists, so my focus is both psychiatrists and their patients on the questions around healing and cure, grief or violence, dissent or calmness, empathy or antipathy, and hope and delusion. How do they portray them? How do they comprehend them? How, where did they con contextualize them in this new era of independence as such? Next slide. My sources are largely the governmental publications, but also journals, private papers of psychiatrists, oral histories and audiovisual archives. By this time, Doordarshan or the national TV had become an important source. All India radio station also had become an important source of archives. And I, I, I plan to dig into them uh, along with the institutional archives as several mental hospital have their separate, not well-maintained archives, but they have archives in, in, in most of these places. And if I can come across, especially, you know, uh, publications and, and, and journals published and unpublished by the psychiatrist. At the other level, I also want to look India within as a global actor within and draw out the global connection um, based on national international conferences, publications, initiatives, and also archival sources, which are from India, Europe, and U UK and USA. Um, and at the present, I am in UK to actually tap into these archives uh, next slide. So the, the central focus somewhere is also on Indianization and Indian psychiatrist. What do I mean by Indianization? Indianization as a term has been used by historians, by the, you know, especially the movement where Indian psychiatrist or, or people from other ranks were able to get into the upper echelon of the colonial services. Indians were not allowed to enter till the 1930s and 40s in, to enter into the upper echelon of the colonial services. So Indians were not superintendent. They were deputy superintendent. They were additional, they were, uh, they, they played various role within the, you know, mental hospital hierarchy, but it's only in the 30s and the 40s. So it was along with the Europeans, they, uh, they, they actually, they played an important role in, in putting across 
uh, their identity, they're putting across their disciplines needs at, point, at the point of the time. Um, the psychiatrists, especially in the 30s, were mostly Europeans, and they faced a lot of so Indian psychiatrists faced racism, and there were no places to train them. Indian psychiatrists till the 50s and 60s, and something I hope to do while I'm here in the UK, is also to look at uh, the Maudsley Institute or the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College came, were, came here to get trained um, throughout this period. Indian psychiatrists, um, as a consequence of that, they felt the discontentment among the, there was a discontentment among these specialists who felt that uh, though they were trained in the West, they went back to work in India and they felt alienated in this context. And then Wig described as Indian psychiatrist who was a very famous Indian psychiatrist as Indian made foreign liquor. On the other hand, A.S. Mihal argued all of us study and teach from Western textbooks of psychiatry. This is inevitable as we do not have enough knowledge about our own psychiatric problems. Next slide. Uh, so they, they attempted once, once they come back and they try to comprehend India and India in the 60s and 70s is this newly independent nation. They, they try to set certain objectives for the mental health movement in India. And the 50s, especially, the objective was to deal with the mentally ill and the objective was the restoration of health. At the other level, the, the objective was also the prevention of mental illness uh, and also promotion of mental health at this moment. And, and, and as much I have been able to, uh, to get through is also number of, uh, a uh, number of um, radio, like radio also started being used as a part of, uh, you know, these discussions where mental health was promoted. And so was Doodarshan or the national television at the time. So promotion of mental health became an important part of it. Prevention also becomes important part of it. Next slide. In the attempt of Indianizing psychiatry, they look back to, they, they look back constantly to Ayurveda as, and piece of knowledge in, 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 in context of India, which is so culturally rich and which has so many religions, these psychiatrists try to comprehend the mental health within the broader context of culture and religion. They focus on the ancient wisdom of, in the ancient wisdom and ancient text, particularly they try to read the, the, the psychiatric taxonomies and you know, from present, to past, so they 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 and they try to also integrate these traditional practices such as hydrotherapy, physical therapy, and this is happening in in Madurai particularly, but in other parts of India also because throughout this period from the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, they are constantly talking about there is a constant discussion about religion, how religion and um, religion along with um, Ayurveda and culture becomes a particular domain of discussion within, within the psychiatrists who are actually trained in the West, but want to come back and trace back their roots in certain ways. Um, they also try to understand culture uh, by understanding its impact on, you know, human behavior. Next slide. So it is also this time when number of uh, number of studies are being conducted. India is, becomes a part of IPSS, which is International Pilot Study of Schizophrenia, which was conducted at the Agra Mental Hospital by KC Dube. Um, he also, he, he's one of the pioneer psychiatrists as this movement. He conducts a pilot investigation of the incidence of the mental disease in India, a study also of the prevalence and biosocial variables in mental illness in rural and urban community. Um, there are other studies which were conducted on urban families, uh, the other work are conducted on you know, rural families, how urban there is attempt to actually comprehend the urban and the rural landscape of India more closely as such. The role of traditional healer becomes an important way of assessing, you know, um, what were the triggers to stress in village community? Community life gets to redefined in certain ways. They, they are, there is this number of attempts, number of epistemolo epidemiological studies which are 
occurring at this moment. Next slide. And here we have uh, Indian Psychiatric Society, which was, uh, you know, meet, picture from Indian Psychiatric Society, um, which is the 11th annual meeting. Now to sum up, I, I just, this is a project which is, at, for me, it's, it's a beginning and I'm still in the process of collecting um, archives, looking at these modern Indian psychiatrists and how they defined the modern Indian psychiatry. What was the moment of, uh, you know, making of the modern Indian psychiatry? Uh, here I quote Venkova Rao, Venkova, Venkova Rao argued that India is, India is an ancient and a great cultural, spiritual, and anthropological laboratory. She has been the nursery of saints and sages, science, scientists, and founders of world's major religion and promulgators of profound philosophy. Nevertheless, to be satisfied with the glory of the past is to turn into a fossil, but to interpret the old from the new point of, of view is to revitalize the past and to bring in current of fresh air into the monotonous present. Uh, the statement itself as a historian, as a trained historian for me is uh, extremely interesting. It is, it is still within the very nationalist framework. They're trying to revitalize the past, revitalize by going back to the ancient Hindu tradition, evoking the golden past, evoking the past which was, you know, uh, and also this glory to it is, is something very interesting. Um, what they have forgotten and what I, I, I need to actually go back to is the, is the context of partition, is the context which they have immediately gone through, the trauma which have only very recently been written about, whereas the literature of the period speaks very loudly about it. So modern Indian psychiatrists and ex psychiatrists psychiatry expressed the nationalist aspirations and glorified the past of the newly independent nation state. However, the voices of minority and the trauma was marginalized. I have not come across much discussion so far on the Yunani medicines or about the Muslim communities as such. So otherization, what was the framework if, and this is too early to say, but yet, you know, at this stage, my research might will evolve, but the very nationalist framework of the Indian National Congress, which actually marginalized the Muslim, marginalized the other communities, even the minorities, the different caste of the order, is actually the larger framework of the psychiatry when it is independent. So I really, we need to really look closely to it and see how it interacts with the world and how it goes back, you know, and how it looks within inside what it actually builds within inside apart from this interaction which is also happening in number of studies and, and, and grappling with, with their own newly independent, newly development phase. Um, another important role I think which I would like to contextualize is also how women's role was understood in this women's economic independence at this point was regarded more as a challenge. And psychiatrists most often reaffirm these gendered role and identities. And I want to see how, and I, why I, I do, you know, want to get into more uh, archives to understand how they are comprehending and, and describing not only the role of the woman, in the changing context, but are they also discussing the role of the changing, you know, how men's domestic rules should also change, which I think was the need of the time. To sum up, um, India becomes this partner of the bilateral exchange of knowledge, and this becomes the hallmark of decolonization in India. Psychiatrists and psychologists become the part of political, social, and intellectual cohort in reshaping and redrawing the language and land, language and landscape of madness during this pe period of transition from colonialism to post-colonialism. Along with psychiatry, I would also try to look at psychology, psychoanalysis, anthropology, and mental social health, uh, mental health social work in India, and how, how it all makes the psych discipline during this time period of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and how they comprehend culture and what, and what is the process of, you know, understanding the Indian psyche as Kukar, so the Kukar has discussed, you know, um, this is also to just sum up an interesting period because India for the first time in the 1987 passes the Indian Mental Health Act.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for these wonderful presentations. Thank you so much, really. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs> to, be con to be continued. To be continued. <laughs> okay. Have a Take good care. night. Yes, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Good night.